2001, and a business and leadership writer by the name of Jim Collins wrote the best-selling book, Good to Great. You're going to see a picture of that. The subtitle is Why Some Companies Make the Leap and the Others Don't. Collins conducted a research on some 11 companies that had made the leap and chronicled why good is often the enemy of great. Business leaders and church leaders gobbled up that book, and if you were among those who did, I will tell you that I am among those who did. Collins defined greatness as the distinctive impact and superior performance, along with what he called a level five leader. In other words, if you had those three things, you were very likely to be a great company. Now, that was in 2001. It's interesting now to reflect on that. It's not surprising also that that good to great would remind us of even a slogan that's going on in our campaign for presidency, Make America Great. Is there any of us who doesn't want to be great? And yet as I studied Micah this week, uh, it's a verse that I had looked at a thousand times, and as I looked at it over and over again, and as I looked at resources, it would appear to me that there's something really that has a flaw in that. The problem, however, with these 11 companies that he studied, interestingly, didn't do so well. <laughs> if you look back and look now, Circuit City was one of the most successful companies profiled in the book. What happened to, what happened to Circuit City? They have closed. They were eaten up by folks like Best Buy and online retailers. How about Fannie Mae? That was one of the companies. <laughs> you don't know who Fannie Mae is, it's the Federal National Mortgage Association that had to be bailed out by the government during the mortgage crisis and be seen by many as one of the contributing factors of that. Pitney Bowles was half its size uh, in 2012 as it was in 2001, and five of the companies, some of these you might have heard of before, Kimberly Clark, Kroger, Walgreens, Wells Fargo, and Abbott Labs, have done okay, but only modest gains since then. One of the companies has actually been bought by a local company called Procter & Gamble. It's the Gillette Company. But the two that have maintained have been Nucor. Not many of you could tell what that is, but it is a steel producer, and almost everybody will know the other company, and that is Philip Morris, a tobacco producer. It'd be easy to scoff at the hindsight of his research, and by the way, he's a great researcher. I've heard him speak numerous times and to kind of push it off, but Micah has something that I think you and I need to look at today. Rather than being good, the good being the enemy of great, biblically speaking, it appears to me that he in fact is saying that greatness is actually the enemy of goodness. Now let's walk our way through that and see if we can figure it out. Things, first of all, if you want to follow along in your worship folder, things are not so great in Micah's day. Micah wrote to the nation of Judah during the time when the nation was under literally the thumb of a Syrian, a Syrian empire and the northern kingdom of Israel had already been swallowed up by the Assyrians in 722 BC. And Jerusalem had only been saved by Hezekiah who actually paid off the invaders. So he's looking out upon a very depressed world. Indeed, it's one of the overarching themes of Micah that he's reflecting back on the good old days, and he is looking at Genesis 12, where God has promised through Abraham, remember, that we, in fact, would be a blessing. So greatness is contingent upon consistency over time, and so Israel demonstrated it could not sustain greatness. The kingdom had reached its height but now it was struggling. Micah chronicles how the nation had come off the rails. And he lists them. He says there was oppression of the poor, corruption of its courts, dishonest economic practices, false prophets, greedy priests, loss of order, and a rejection of God, justice, and his commandments. Then I'm glad that's not pertinent to today, is it? In the first five verses of chapter 6 of Micah, let's read them. Stand up and plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusation. 
Listen, you everlasting foundation of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to you, also Aaron and Miriam. My people remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted, and what Balaam, son of Boer, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgah, that you may know the righteous acts of God. It's almost like a slideshow of the past when you think about it. He's giving slide after slide after slide and showing how God has, in fact, delivered them from their enemies, and yet they rejected the very one who brought them this far. How could they possibly be blessed, let alone a blessing to other nations? They were no longer great or even good. And so through the prophet, God is in fact placing judgment on the nation. And so he's asking, Micah is asking us, how do we get back? How do we get back? And so we first learn that it won't be because we achieve greatness. It appears to be that we need to rediscover goodness. We'll look at that. But Micah says in verses 6 and 7, what we'll do, what, will we, what must we do to get back on track? Verses 6 and 7, with what shall I come before the Lord and, be, and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand of rams and ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Shall I Offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. Wow. Now take note of what he's saying there. They are, these are all ridiculously expensive sacrifices. And so what he's saying is, if you really wanted to be a good, have the good religious metric for being a great person in terms of God, for any Israelite, at least, you would have to do all of those things. And what he's saying, we're never going to have that kind of greatness. But he says that's not the point. The superior religious performance, the thing that God really desired of them, is what he wants. And it isn't just being able to purchase all of those kinds of sacrifices, which, again, would be, have been extremely expensive. So take this forward to the church of today. Let's walk around this with what shall we come before the Lord? With our buildings and our filled seats and our million dollar budgets. And you say, boy, aren't you glad we aren't like that? We don't have a million dollar budget. Well, you know, this church last year brought in well over a half million dollars. Will God be pleased if we show him that we are successful if we're bigger and better and faster and stronger. Is that a sign of the Lord that the Lord has, in fact, blessed us? This kind of nation that God blessed is greatness what God wants and expects of us. And then he had to go along and say, verse 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So what does the Lord desire? What does the Lord desire? Goodness or greatness? It has been God's desire all along, I suspect, from the very moments that God, in fact, created us and chose to continue to bless us, that we, in fact, were called to be good. Matter of fact, when God began the creation process, he created on that first day and he said, now this is great. No, he didn't, did he? He said, this is good. This is good. So, how do we measure goodness? Let's spend the rest of our time on how we measure goodness. What does such goodness look like and how do we measure it? So, first, let's recognize upfront and personal that we really do have no goodness of our own. That we can pretend like it, I don't know but about you, but my goodness lasts about 15 minutes. And if God is, in fact, not in control of so much of my motives and reasons for doing what I do, it will be, well, it won't be good. Kirk Tomlinson is a pastor of a Methodist church in Lebanon, Ohio, and he said something this week that I caught. He said, goodness is something that is all of God, whereas greatness is what we humans attempt. In other words, God's trying to pour his goodness in us, 
He's trying to remind us that if you'll just let my goodness flow through you, it will be enough. But no, you kind of get these aspirations. And so what happens is you want to be great and you fail. And so after every failure, you give up the journey instead of saying, oh, it is your goodness, that day-to-day goodness that you seek for my life. So what is it? What is that first step? Well, he says we must do justice. Verse 8 says that goodness is a part of doing justice. The word there, and I've found a way to describe it for you. I found not only uh, a transliteration of the word, but I found an image for you. Now, how many of you are Hebrew scholars? Okay. Well, uh, I'm not either, but I'm going to pretend like I am for the next couple of minutes. No, I'm not going to. But mishpat is the transliteration on the left. But the issue really is that weight. It's the justice, the weighing scales there, that God always wants his justice to bear on our world. And if you make a careful note in the Bible, places no limit on our kindness here. It's do justice, kindness. Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. I wish he hadn't said that, don't you? Because it makes it very, very difficult. Not that I really wish he wouldn't. I'm glad Jesus said it. I'm glad he has challenged us. But kindness is among the most basic requirements. Kindness is the first business of any follower of Christ. Imagine this. If you were given a dollar for every time you spoke a kind word or a deed to another person, but... 50 cents was taken every time you did the opposite. I wonder how much money you'd have today. Next, true goodness is the result of loving kindness. Micah builds on justice then by saying that true goodness is also the result of loving kindness. So from justice, we move over to this kindness issue, but it is a particular kind of kindness. Now, if you want to see the Hebrew word for this one, it's chesed. It's chesed, and that what, it's what the Hebrew looks like. And if you look at the underneath there, it says a love that will not let you go. That's the kind of loving kindness that the Bible talks about, particularly in the Old Testament when it speaks of chesed. It's the word that says, I will not let go of you. Justice is much larger, and it's much more complicated than kindness. You and I can do kindness. You know, we can begin even on our own efforts to make an effort to be kind. But it's when we step across that line of trying to be honestly just with people that it gets difficult. Abraham Lincoln began his journey with kindness to justice when he saw a slave girl who was being sold on the auction block like a head of cattle. She was being sold away from her family and friends, and he saw the fright and the terror in her eyes, and he said that day to himself, this thing must go. He was referring not simply to the fact that this woman need not to be on a block sold like a piece of cattle, but that this institution called slavery must in fact end. No concept is more Christian or more American than our demand for justice. And whether we are people who are oppressed or whether we are politically or economically or racially oppressed, we need to understand that kindness always connects to justice. Now let me give you a very, very practical experience with this. This church has been assisting a family uh, over the long haul and has been doing some marvelous things. One of our Sunday school classes has been doing some really powerful things with this And I love it when they're just going about it, and I just know about it on the periphery. I know that we're loving our folks, and I was brought into that situation this week to deal with a a part of it. And without giving any specifics, let me tell you where I crossed the line. It's one thing to be kind, but when you cross the line and you see something being done that's not just, do I cross that line? In other words, I saw something as I began to deal with the situation that would cause me to do something about this situation. There was something illegal about what was being done to them. Now, do I go bury my head in the sand and say, no, 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 I didn't see that, I didn't hear that, I didn't see that? 
Let's just be kind to them. Okay, let's don't bring justice. Because justice is much more difficult. Charles Dickens used to tell about being in England some 200 years ago. And he saw 12-year-old boys working in coal mines. Some of you are probably old enough to know that you were raised, if you knew anything about the area that I was raised, that my family's from in Hazard, Kentucky, you know that I know a lot about coal mines as well, hearing the stories from my grandfather. Charles would tell about the story of these 12-year-olds that were working in the mines. They couldn't go to school and that kind of thing until finally someday those poor families in England who had a lifetime of hard work in the coal mines when they were only children, the church tried to be kind to those young men. They would offer them gifts at Christmas time. The families would receive charity and holiday turkeys. The church would offer prayers for those little boys. And then one day, however, the leaders said in their meeting that something had to be done. And so what they did was they insisted that those little boys not have to work in those coal mines and that they, in fact, needed to go to school. And they did that. That's, my friend, is the difference between kindness and justice. Justice always costs us more. Kindness is about Christmas presents. Justice is about working to make sure that people have opportunities. Fear that if we as a church are going to be content with kindness, it's not a bad thing, but it's not the best thing that we need to be doing in terms of being what Micah would say as being good. Someone has illustrated justice this way. Two people are strolling on the riverside one day, and suddenly they see a, a child, a baby in the river, floating down the river. They jump in grab that baby, bring it out, send it to the hospital, and they take care of it. The next day, there are a couple of people walking by, and they look out, sure enough, in the river, there are two more children floating down, and they jump in, they pull them out, and they take them to the hospital. The next day, they see a number of babies in the river, more than they could catch up with, and so some of them passed away, and some of them were able to be taken to the emergency service. You see, the first man says to the other this. He says, isn't it wonderful that through our faith, we are here during the tragic time of need? The other man says, I think we better get moving and get to the head of the river and find out why all those babies are being thrown into the river. One is kindness and the other one is justice. Whether it is Syria or Sudan or here at home, where there are people being treated cruelly, we have responsibility. Doing justice is much more complicated than kindness. That is not a popular theme in the world in which we live. Let the babies spin for themselves or charity begins at home. And I would say to you, yes, it does. I would agree with that. But if it stops at home, we are a tragically flawed body of believers. If charity begins at home and stays there, we are a tragically flawed group of believers. We are here today for one reason, and that is because God so loved the world and that he gave his only son. We are here today because a man from Galilee cared more for us than he cared for himself. And so if our response is to shut ourselves off from our little designer cocoons with our luxury cars and our expensive high-tech toys and our big screen TVs and say that we are just going to be kind from a distance, then we are in deep spiritual trouble. And so finally, goodness means walking humbly with God. I'll tell you that I spent probably a better part of an hour trying to find a good Hebrew translation for the word that is to walk humbly, to humbly. It, 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 it really is to literally to humbly walk. And there is, it's the only time this Hebrew word is used in the Bible. And I think it's that reason for a reason. The word, while it's awfully tr uh, often translated humbly, it probably is better to talk about it in terms of to walk wisely or to walk. In other words, faith is an experience 
that causes us to be going in a direction. Not just, oh, I'm going to be kind, I'm going to be kind, I'm going to be kind in a circle, but rather I'm going to be kind and I'm going to seek justice and I'm going to walk humbly. That there is a direction to our lives that seeks to bring not only our faith experience in a live way, but in a real way, an authentic way. Few characteristics are more appealing in a person than genuine humility. Think of the person that you know. If you don't know a person, let me introduce you to Doc Gibson. I've never been in his presence that I've not felt like he understood and knew humility. And the fact that he lives with the saints of God has a lot to do with it, I'm sure. But I don't know anybody that exhibits humility that is not a very unique person. Micah is talking about a special kind of humility here. Little did he know at the time that Jesus would talk about that later. And he said, blessed are the meek for what? They shall inherit the earth. Now, if you and I inherit the earth, it means that we're going to be responsible. We're going to hang in there with people. We're going not only to be kind, but we're going to seek justice for them as best we can. And that will, in fact, most clearly show that we are walking humbly with God. I love the picture that John Killinger talks about. He said he read it in Atlantic Monthly magazine a number of years ago. I couldn't find it. But I love the story. It's a story about a little burrow. Now, if you don't know what a burrow is, then let me just explain it to you. If you look in the... If you look in the dictionary, they'll use, well, they'll use the, the three-letter word, and then they'll use donkey. But a burrow is, in fact, a small donkey that's used to, usually just to pack, um, a pack animal, really. Well, the true story about that John Killinger tells is that there was a little burrow that was employed in its heyday as, uh, with cattle ranchers because it helped tame the wild and rambunctious steers. In other words, they had a steer that they could not get a control of. They would tie this little burrow to that steer, and they would run their way out of, out of Dodge. And sure enough, in a few days, after that crazy steer had drugged that burrow all over, they'd come walking back, and sure enough, that little burrow was in the lead, trotting along home with that big submissive steer behind it. Why? Why did it happen? That burrow, I don't know I'm, if I'm being appropriate here, but he didn't have enough sense to think anything else about his life except to walk along. Just keep walking along no matter what things happen. He just kept walking along. Until finally that steer experienced enough trying to get away that it just submitted. Now, I don't know what that says all about you and me, but there is a submitted, submissive line in all of us that God needs and wants. And when that sub submission gets in us, then we don't have to worry about being kind. It'll come out of us. We don't have to worry about being seeking justice. It will come out of us. We don't have to worry about walking humbly. Pastor Tony Bland described a humble person this way. Talks about two statues. You're going to see both of them here. The first one is one of a Roman god Vulcan. Uh, there is a large uh, statue. If you go to Birmingham, Alabama, you'll see that statue. It's Vulcan. He, by the way, if you don't know, Birmingham at one point was like Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It was known for its, uh, you know, its industry, and that was there. But if you're not careful, you'll miss the other statue that's in town. Upon this red mountain, there's a, another little statue, and it's called Brother Bryant. You see one of them there, and now I've got another one that's a close-up. Brother Bryant was simply a Presbyterian pastor in the area, and he has erected, they have erected, because when he died, the, he, had been, he had so impacted that community in the tw last 25 years of his life because he constantly prayed and sought and loved people. 
that they erected a statue of him overlooking. I will just tell you that in a world where power, power, power is all about power, 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 you and I need to know and understand the power of God will ultimately not only win in the end, but it will win now as we live out the experience of a new relationship. This brother, Brian, he, he demonstrated a power that none of them probably could understand. In that power is the power of God. So three simple, courageous things. You know, I'm a research person, and there's a book out called The Early Christian Church, and it was the, the title intrigued me. You'll see a picture of it in just a moment. The Patient Ferment of the Early Church. You read the book, you'll find out that of all the strategies that they found in the early church, they studied the early church and how it grew so rapidly, how things began to happen. And when they really got it down to reduce to what it really had caused the, 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 the New Testament church to do what it was doing, it was one simple thing. It was patient faithfulness. They inducted all members in a three-year process. Imagine that. How many people... Do you think in our world we'll go through three years to get inside the fellowship of the congregation? They believed in a patient faithfulness. Now, I don't know about you, but that's good news when I think about it. Let me be honest with you. We live in a world where great, great, great. Let me tell you where we live, really. I mean, I love and support the ministry of Crossroads Community Church. I do. I know the pastor, his sister went to my church in Nashville. They just quote, purchased or whatever three more churches in Lexington area. I don't know how all that works. My daughter goes there, but she even missed me this past week. I say all that to say, I listen, I love them and want them to do what they're doing. I, but what we do here is significantly different than that, isn't it? Yeah. Why do, people, why do many people go there? We've had at least three couples, and I know two of my close friends go there now that grew up Baptists, have been around Baptists all their lives. They hate the music, generally. All, all of them that I know almost hate the music. But boy, they want to go. Why? Because I think they like being a part of something anonymously where they can be What do you do? I belong to Crossroads. Now, now, Pastor Brian would, would, would hate that analogy, but he knows it's true. That there are some people who go there just because they want to be a part of something great. And I would say, go if it does for you what it's doing for my daughter. But what we do here is different but the same. We try to do what is good every day so that God can be great. Let's pray. Father, we are here because we want desperately to be in your presence. There is nothing more important than that for us. Nothing. At our best, we just want to empty our lives and have you fill them up. At our best, that's who we want to be. We want to be a people who live with kindness and justice and who day by day walk humbly with the God who has saved us. May it be so, Father. May it be so as we pray this prayer today in Christ's name.